What we are bringing you tonight is entitled Lessons from the Lobster Boat Blockade. And in that fine Quaker tradition that maintains that we are all students and all teachers in the school of the spirit, we will hear from an active student, an active listener, and an active teacher. Friends, please welcome J.O. Good evening. It is such a pleasure to be here with many of you who I know and recognize and a bunch of new, new folks. It's great to be up in Maine. And thank you to Durham and, uh, and to 350 Maine and Falmouth Cat. Freeport, Freeport Cat, not Falmouth. Okay. I'm going to spend what I hope to be the next half hour or so um, telling the story of this little lobster boat blockade uh, and then reviewing what I've learned in the process of doing this and then open up a conversation about the role of nonviolent civil disobedience and direct action in building a powerful movement to get the change that we need. Um, I want to introduce myself a little bit more before uh, I'm not just a guy with a lobster boat who blocked a coal ship. Um, I grew up on Cape Cod, and uh, about eight years ago, seven years ago, I moved back to my hometown, uh, which is actually the town of Bourne, uh, and have been living there, uh, working part time as a sailmaker uh, for the last six years, uh, while spending the rest of my time and the rest of my non work life. Um, pursuing this question of what are we supposed to do with this climate crisis? How are we supposed to live given what we know about the state of the world? Uh, I'll dig more into some of the detours and loops that that journey has taken uh, over the last four or five years uh, through the conversation. But I want to start out with uh, just the story of what happened last, uh, well, Two years ago now, originally, two years ago, uh, on May 15th, 2013, my friend Ken Ward uh, and my friend Marla Markham uh, gathered on a dock in Newport, Rhode Island uh, at a, the startling hour of like 5.30 or 6 in the morning. Ken and I have been kind of friends and acquaintances in climate work for uh, a number of years. He was a former deputy director and interim director of Greenpeace USA, uh, founder of, a co-founder of much of the United States Public Interest Research Group network, the PERGS, as well as a litany of environmental uh, organizations. Marla uh, is a Methodist and a fellow traveler in this journey of faith and how we're supposed to reconcile ourselves to the planet. After a short prayer on the, on the dock in which Marla invoked scripture saying that perfect love casts out fear, uh, we motored away in our, our little lobster boat, which is rechristened the Henry David Team. Uh, no, no, I'm pointing this direction, I'm pointing the wrong direction. North through uh, Narragansett Bay to the Brayton Point coal fire generating plant, which is the single largest source of climate change and carbon emissions in all of New England. This sucker burns more coal than anywhere uh, in New England or New York or New Jersey on most years, depending on the natural gas prices. We headed north um, because, well, I'm from Massachusetts, Ken is from Massachusetts, and where should we go if we're from Massachusetts then to the biggest source of the problem? Uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, and we navigated our little boat up alongside the coal pier, uh, and we dropped some anchors around nine, nine o'clock in the morning. We dropped a little boat size anchor, and then we dropped a 250 pound mushroom anchor that was a uh, bicycle locked to the keel of the boat, which uh, made us relatively immovable. <laughs> and we waited. Uh, for a number of things to happen. First, we called the police and let them know that 
we were there and we were protesting. Uh, and then we waited for them to try and figure out what that actually meant in reality. Um, we waited for the Coast Guard to arrive and, and the authorities to arrive to deal with us. And we also waited for a 450 foot long hulking <coughs> black ship called the Energy Enterprise, which has had made its way north as it does routinely from Norfolk, Virginia, where it loads coal from the coal fields of West Virginia that come down on trains into Norfolk uh, and brings it one place, which is Brayton Point. We'd positioned our little boat so that, uh, so that the ship could dock half on the pier and not endanger anyone, but was not in a place where it could unload its coal. We were boarded by the Coast Guard. You can see them in their fabulous uh, uh, red vests over there uh, on the boat. And they did their routine safety inspection and then spent probably five hours on a conference call trying to figure out what the heck to do with these guys on a lobster boat. <laughs> because we were in navigable water. We were anchored. Uh, well, it took them a long time to figure out what to do with us, and they started bringing all their toys, which was great, because once you start bringing all the toys, you want to use them, and that created an another nice delay while the boat sat there not unloading its coal. Um, so the Coast Guard got called, the state police dive team from Framingham, Massachusetts got called, and so we waited a couple more hours for the state police dive team to come down and dive on the boat to make sure that we had in fact placed the anchor there that we had, we had alleged. They found in fact that we had, that's exactly what we did, we put a 250 pound mushroom on the bottom, chained to the bottom of the boat, um, and kind of an uh, surprising twist, we expected that we would be pretty immediately arrested and hauled off and the boat would be impounded and they would figure some way to cut the chain and, and take the boat out of the way. And they didn't seem to want to do that. Uh, not sure why. I think part of it was we weren't being assholes. We were being really pleasant compliant, friendly, uh, engaging, to the point where the Coast Guard was making jokes with us as we waited and they were on their conference call. They were giving us tips on how to use the radar on the boat. <laughs> and when the state police dive team finally unlocked the giant anchor, the head Coast Guard guy, there were four, now four Coast Guard guys and a, one state trooper on the boat, comes into the cabin where we are with the bicycle you lock and says, hey guys, here's your lock back. <laughs> so we ended the day having been threatened uh, with a $40,000 a day fine and ordered to leave by the Coast Guard. We were ordered to hire a salvage crew to come with a crane and a barge and lift up the anchor. And Aside from a uh, warning, a written warning that we had in our safety inspection failed to have a foghorn on board, we motored away under our own power uh, across the river to Fall River where we had a Portuguese dinner that couldn't be beat. Not sure what would happen after that. Well, we weren't sure in a lot of ways what would happen. But the first things that happened were people started organizing around Brayton Point. We'll come back to this a little bit later. People started organizing around Brayton Point to close it down. There had been a coal-free Massachusetts coalition for a number of years trying to close Brayton Point by 2020. We were the first folks on the lobster boat to come out and say, this has to be shut down immediately. And that inspired a lot more people to come out and be bold and say, we know what's going on with the climate crisis. We know that we have to start transitioning now away from carbon-based fuels, away from coal, and we have to start here in Massachusetts with these giant coal plants. So let's shut it down now. There were something like 400 people at the gates of the plant that day in July uh, with some, somewhere on the order of 40, 40 or 44 folks who risked arrest 
trespassing at the gates of the plant to show their commitment to seeing an end to the era of fossil fuels in New England. That same summer, there was a, another march that started uh, right across the river from the plant and, and marched for a week towards what was once and may hopefully again be the future site of the Cape Wind Project, the first proposed offshore wind farm in the United States. There was some great energy uh, that came out that summer. We also received a nice written summons to go to court on four state charges. Um, and as we, hadn't, as we had expected to get arrested and ended up motoring out of there of our own, of our own, uh, under our own power, uh, and we didn't quite expect that to happen, as uh, we were surprised and amazed at the transformative and energizing nature of the rallies and protests that happened at Brayton Point that, uh, that summer, uh, we also were surprised at how our legal proceedings proceeded. We had decided, um, as both Ken and I are, are people of faith, although Ken's, I think, much more the intellectual environmentalist than I am, which is great, because I am not as political as he is, and he's very sharp in that way. But both of us were really clear that we couldn't just go in, we weren't going to go in to court and argue against the charges in the normal way that one would argue against the charges. We also weren't kind of clear to do the Gandhian thing, which would, Gandhi's traditional thing would be you go in and plead guilty and say, please give me the maximum, if you believe this law is just, give me the maximum punishment. Um, Gandhi is usually breaking the laws that he was trying to oppose. Um, so we were in a slightly different position in that we were breaking laws that we agreed with, which were good safety rules around how to operate ships on, on, on the ocean. But we were convinced that we were doing it because <coughs> of a higher purpose. And there is fortunately a little legal, legal uh, tactic called the necessity defense in which uh, it's legally permissible to argue that you are breaking a lesser law to serve a higher law or to avert a greater public danger. The judge had allowed us to proceed bringing in the, some of the top climate scientists from across the country to testify on our behalf to say that, in fact, this is a real and present danger, and these folks were doing what is needed to stop the burning of fossil fuels and, of, and change our course away from a climate catastrophe. We showed up on May 8th with a whole bunch of people, and similar to how the day of the actual blockade went, uh, our trial day didn't quite go as planned either. Um, when we arrived in court, we started hearing that uh, the prosecutor came to us and said, you know, we don't really want to charge you guys with these things or prosecute you for them. Uh, can we have a conversation about that? And what they ended up doing is that, not just the prosecutor, but we, we realized things were getting serious when the district attorney came in uh, and, and said he wanted to meet with us and have a conversation. He didn't want us to plea. He didn't want us to you know, have a bargain. But he wanted to be clear that with us uh, that he couldn't in good conscience prosecute us uh, because he agrees that climate change is an excruciatingly large problem and that nothing's really been done about it. Uh, so he dropped the felony charges uh, and reduced entirely and reduced the misdemeanor charges to like simple parking tickets with a <laughs> fine attached to them. And we said, okay, <laughs> great. Um, this is not what we were planning to do. This is not what we were expecting. Um, but it didn't quite end there. We went out outside the courthouse and gave a little press conference. Um, we had great coverage. NPR was there. Uh, NBC affiliate was there. Um, some radio fo other radio folks were there. Uh, we had uh, 150 or so of our supporters who were there, and it was a wonderful atmosphere. There was some singing. The district attorney alleges that there was dancing. I don't think I saw the dancing, but you know, uh, that's awesome. 
And then the district attorney came out, uh, Mr. Sam Sutter there uh, in the suit, to uh, give a statement. In our conversations with him, we said, well, this is all well and good that you are doing this because you agree with us. Um, we'll only accept this if you, in fact, come out and say that publicly. Uh, and he had taken some time and wrote one of the most amazing and compelling statements that I've ever heard from a living politician <laughs> about climate change. He said that cli the climate crisis is one of the uh, defining moral challenges of our time, that the political leadership has been gravely lacking, and while he doesn't agree with the fact that we broke the law, does agree with the fact that it is absolutely necessary to take dramatic, bold action to avert climate catastrophe. And then, waving a copy of Bill McKibben's uh, summer article from Rolling Stone uh, in his hand, which was literally entitled A Call to Arms, which is an ironic thing for a district attorney to be waving around. <laughs> um, he's had, he actually has a great record of, on gun control, which is really interesting. <laughs> um, uh, he pledged to see us in New York City for the People's Climate March on September 21st. That was not what we were expecting. <laughs> Um, and subsequently, in fact, we did meet him uh, in New York City with a whole bunch of people from Massachusetts, uh, in 350 Massachusetts, and, and marched for several hours with him through the streets of New York with his entire family and a good number of his staff from the district attorney's office. That's the story of the lobster boat blockade. I want to step back a little and talk about some of the lessons that I draw from this and that I think a movement, in order to be effective, needs to draw from these acts of direct action civil disobedience. This is going to be in no particular order. And we'll talk a little bit about, we'll talk about them afterwards. I think the first thing that we need to keep in the center here is the question of, while we are saying that things need to change, while we are saying that the world is dramatically off course, are we willing to live our lives commensurate with that truth? Or is it just going to be words? Are we willing and able to act like the world is ending if we, in fact, believe that the world is ending, or some equivalent. That sounds really harsh, so we play around with that. OK, maybe it is. But are we willing to act like that? The second is not everyone is called to be on the boat. We all don't have the same job. We're not all given the same work to do in this struggle. My role, it became very clear, was that I was supposed to be on a lobster boat in front of a coal ship for now. Why? I have no idea. I had been thinking for a while uh, that it was time to start stepping up direct action on climate change. And I had spent, uh, I don't know, a year before the action calling some people, trying to talk with people, seeing if anyone was really engaged and interested in doing these sorts of actions. And the answer I heard was, that sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> Until one kind of fateful night, uh, vigiling on the Boston uh, Government Center Plaza for, uh, to get the Senate candidates, Elizabeth Warren and Scott Brown, to start talking about climate change in their debates. And my friend Ken Ward shows up at 2 in the morning while we're huddled under our tarps trying to keep our little candle lanterns burning on the eve of Hurricane Sandy <laughs> with a giant hot thermos of apple cider and says, Jay, I have an idea. Why don't we get a boat and block the ship at Brayton Point? At that moment, my heart really leapt for joy because I knew that that's exactly where I was supposed to be, that my life with having grown up on Cape Cod, having spent a lot of time working on boats, being the navigator was 
clearly going to be my role. That I had spent time working on tall ships, so I could talk the talk the Coast Guard talk on the radio. Uh, that was clearly where I was supposed to be. Ken had never piloted anything larger than a 16-foot canoe, um, but he was the politics guy, and he was the he was the movement guy, and knew those pieces that needed to be covered. So not everyone's called to be on the boat. There were people on shore who were supporting us. There were people uh, back at home who were waiting in case we got the bail call. There were people who had every role. There were people who then show, showed up during the summer at the rallies. There were people who showed up at the trial. There's a there are a lot of roles. We'll come back to that a little later. So the question there is, what's yours? What is uniquely yours to do? I think this whole saga proved to me, again, to expect the unexpected, be open to the unexpected, and be prepared for the unexpected to be way more powerful than you could have ever planned for. There was a lot of this action that was flying by the seat of our pants, uh, and from the fact that like, we didn't know we were going to do it on May 15th until three day, four days before uh, the action happened. We literally got a call from the boatyard, and they were like, boat's going in tomorrow. And we're like, really? OK. Uh, let's look on the internet and see where the coal ship is. And, they're like, and we're like, oh, it's coming up on Wednesday. Interesting. I guess we're going to do this this week. To the fact that as we were motoring up Narragansett Bay, we were still trying to get all our technology to work. We were still trying to get our live streaming to work. Nothing, is, nothing was working when we left the dock. But by some miracle, uh, we were there ready uh, by the time we arrived. Part of that, I think, the reason for that, uh, expecting the unexpected, unexpected and being open to it, is that we don't know, I'm currently convinced, we don't know what the best possible outcome could be. And for me and my faith, I leave that into God's hands to figure out what that's going to be, as long as I am faithful on the steps on the road that I am taking. We were kind of expecting that being arrested would be kind of the dramatic thing. We thought that maybe run, having this trial with these like international experts was going to be the thing that was important and the best outcome we could never have anticipated leaving under, under our own power or having a district attorney walk in a climate march with us instead of prosecuting us. I want to talk a little bit about what direct action looks like in ways that are effective. For me, Thinking about direct action a lot is really important because there, are, there seem to be a number of uh, groups and individuals all across the country who the, the mentality is, if I go get arrested, then I'm doing the most hardcore thing that I can be, and that's going to show them. I'm not so convinced. I think it takes more thought than that. Underlying that is the assumption that I'm going to show them is the right attitude for taking direct action. That you people are wrong. I am going to sacrifice myself uh, in showing that you were wrong and hope that somehow you will change. I don't know about your life, but I have never experienced someone um, in my own personal relations trying to sacrifice themselves in front of me while being angry at me, uh, convince me that I needed to change. <laughs> or create a compelling case that I should go out and help them do what they're doing. What does make good direct action, I'm convinced, is not when it's about me being cool, which there's a lot of culture of cool around direct action. 
But when direct action takes on a confessional tone that says, I don't know what else to do in these times, but put myself in the way of the status quo. I can't go on living my normal everyday life as this machine rolls on and I have to put myself somehow in the way. Which I think illustrates then what a good action should look like. It should put ourselves right in between the harm that is about to be created. We should be putting ourselves between the incoming ship and the power plant that's ready to burn it. We should make it clear in that action, not because we're doing some symbolic arrest by trespassing on a plant or impeding someone who is trying to get to their job, but in a simple picture, we should be able to see what's right and what's wrong. And for those who are watching at home, have that conviction of, wow, which side am I on in this picture? Am I on the side of the big hulking black ship or am I on the side of the little white lobster boat? In coming to the action with this confessional, I don't know what to do, so I have ended up here. I think we also create an invitational space that's not blaming, that's not shaming, that's not angry, but is inviting to those who might be our most unlikely allies if that if they have the same tender conscience as we do, that they can move into the space calling for change as well. And I'm pretty convinced that that's what happened with our district attorney friend. If we had been uh, angry, if we had been dismissive of and non you know, non-compliant with the Coast Guard, he would have never been open to the opportunity and the possibility that he could like us. And in making our enemy, not the authorities, but the big pile of coal in the ship that was coming in to bring more of it, uh, we could make friends with those who were there to enforce the law. I think what good action does is it discloses unseen reality. It makes the invisible, visible. This power plant has been on this peninsula for something like 40 or 50 years, burning away. And most people don't ever think of it. We drive, there's a big interstate highway bridge that goes right by it. And hundreds of thousands of people drive over that bridge, seeing that coal plant, not thinking uh, anything about it. But we made people think about it and drew attention and focus to it. We made, I think, the flipping of the light switch, which is normally completely disconnected from what's happening on the other end, connected to a big black ship and a giant pile of coal. Most of all, I'm convinced that if we're going to change things, and like I said, civil disobedience and direct action is just one part of that whole thing, but I think it's a really important part. But if we're going to make that change from the status quo barreling forwards like it is, a lot of us are going to start to have to take, we're going to have to start taking risks. We're not going to change the world by being comfortable. And in taking risk, we are realizing that in order to change anything outside, the first thing we have to change is ourselves. The only thing we have agency over is I. The only thing that I get to decide what changes is me. So am I going to continue to go on with my life knowing that things are broken and wrong and maintaining my comfort, maintaining my security, 
or am I going to open myself to the possibility that there is something else that I might be called to? A friend of mine uh, says that movements don't create social change. Change happens through contagious acts of transformation. I am utterly convinced that that is true. From the folks in the local neighborhood across from the plant who came out the day we were blocking the ship and said, oh my God, you are the first people who have ever stood up for us. To hundreds of people coming out to raise the demand and say, this has to end now. To a prosecutor who, was, who had all the authority to spend a week of trial time trying to put us in jail who came and walked with us for hours in New York on a climate march, that the act of living our lives in accord with the truth that we speak with our mouths, the act of living commensurate with the scope and scale of the problem allows other people who know in their hearts, I think we all know in our hearts, that things really have to change. And that in acting and living out that truth, we give hope to people who otherwise wouldn't believe that it's possible to change. I want to close my part of the talking with a few moments of silence. And I would invite you all to reflect in this time, find out what's stirring in your heart, what questions are arising, what new thoughts or challenges are arising. And then in a few moments, we may enter into a conversation and see where the evening takes us.